Good day to everyone joining us and welcome to today's X Talks webinar. Today's talk is entitled Digital Clinical Trials Avoiding Pitfalls with Intelligent Study Design. My name is Sonia Hunt and it's my pleasure to be your X Talks moderator for today. Today's webinar will run for approximately 60 minutes and it's going to be a lively roundtable discussion with our panelists. This presentation includes a Q&A session, I'm sorry, a Q&A session with our speakers, and this webinar is designed to be interactive, and webinars work best when you're involved. So please feel free to submit questions and comments for our speakers throughout this presentation using the questions chat box, and we'll try to attend to your questions during the Q&A session. Now, this chat box is located in the control panel on the right-hand side of your screen. If you require any assistance, please contact me at any time by sending a message using this chat panel. At this time, all participants are in listen-only mode. Please note that this event will be recorded and made available for streaming on xtalks.com. At this point, I'd like to thank OVO Health, who developed the content for this presentation. OBO Health is a global digital clinical trials company that has been revolutionizing clinical research since 2017. Their unique model combines best practice clinical science with a flexible digital platform and expert virtual site team, all of which enables them to digitally optimize studies and smoothly run them from end to end. They don't just theorize digital, they practice it delivering clinical trials that provide sponsors with the robust therapeutic evidence they need. Now, it's my pleasure to introduce you to our moderator for today's webinar, and she is Dr. Florence Molden. There she is. Hello. She is an expert ECOA scientist who has spent her career advising and guiding clinical research organizations on the digitalization and remote capture of clinical outcome assessments, as well as the use of health devices in clinical trials. Dr. Molin works with both clinical and technology teams to optimize the implementation of ECOAs according to the industry, regulatory, and scientific best practices. And Dr. Molin holds a PhD in social, genetic, and developmental psychiatry from King's College. And now with that, I'm now going to pass the mic over to Flo to welcome our speakers. So Flo, it's all up to you, or Thank over you. to you. <laughs> Thank you, Sonia, and welcome everybody. Thank you for attending today. So um, delighted to introduce you to my panel today. So I've got Steve Schaefer with me, who is the Chief Executive Officer of My Helper, and this is a company that develops therapies to address unmet needs in pain and mood disorders. And he is the sponsor of a recent migraine medical device study, and we're going to be discussing some elements of that study today. So thanks for joining, Steve. Um, right. Next, I've got with me Matty Lynch. So Matty Lynch is the Chief Operations Officer at Obvio Health. She brings over 30 years of experience uh, implementing clinical research programs, and she has been with us at Obvio since 2017, using all of that experience to guide our clinical operations teams as we implement trials for our sponsors. Um, we also are very lucky today to have Caitlin Landry with us and Caitlin was actually a participant in one of the trials that we ran and um, suffers from migraine disease so it's really great to have her perspective today on her experience with migraine disease and of taking part in a clinical trial so thanks for joining us. And then last, but by absolutely no means least, we have Dr. Charleston with us today. So Dr. Charleston is an expert neurologist specializing in headache medicine, um, and is also a professor in the Department of Neurology at Michigan State University. So we're very lucky to have him with us today. So to get us going and to set some of the context, um, at Obvio Health last year, we conducted a survey to get the, the perspectives from individuals who suffer with migraine disease about um, their perspectives on clinical trial participation. So we were first asking them about the types of symptoms that they experience, and this is by no means surprising, but it does really feed into understanding their preferences for participating in clinical trials. So they experience a range of symptoms um, and as we'll see in the next slide, 
these have an impact on their preference for how they would like to participate in clinical research. And we can see from the statistics below that it's very much in support of remote participation in clinical trials. So most would prefer to travel no more than 30 minutes to a clinical site if they needed to be going into a site to take part in a trial. Most would prefer digital methods for data capture, as well as digital methods for communication with them throughout the clinical trial. And also many would prefer to conduct their assessments via telehealth, so over a televisit as opposed to having to go into a physical site. So to get us going, I'd love to hear, Caitlin, from you, you know, is this in line with how you experience migraine disease and yeah, absolutely. Um, it is. Um, I have suffered with migraines for several years. Um, I was having about 12 to 14 migraine days a month. Um, I would have um, ocular migraines, uh, nausea, facial pain, head pain, throbbing, sensitivity to sound and light. Um, I'm currently taking a seizure medication, which I'm not super happy about, but it has afforded me a lot of relief. Um, so um, I, I do appreciate the fact that um, I don't have to drop everything um, and come in during all of that going on, um, not to mention driving while that's going on. Um, I'm a mother, so, you know, it, it, sometimes it's not feasible for me to drop everything and run, um, you know, especially when you're in that kind of pain and, you know, you have to worry about, oh, well, 3.30, I have to get my kid off the bus. So um, it, it's very... Um, convenient to have all of that in home instead of having a drop and run. Thank you. Um, Dr. Charleston, as a treating physician and then an investigator in clinical trials, would you agree with me? Yes. I mean, what I hear uh, Caitlin say is very, very common. So first of all, let's, let's talk about migraine disease very quickly. Migraine is a brain disease. More specifically, it's a chronic episodic neurological disease, sometimes even chronic, chronic uh, neurological uh, disease. Um, and it's the second most disabling neurological disease. Many people don't may not recognize that, but it's the second most, and this is on a global scale. In the United States, um, it, it affects approximately, it's been estimated 40 million uh, people with migraine disease. Um, and that, that estimate is about two to three women to men. So we're talking about 30 million women and 10 million men. And so it is not a rare disease. And migraine is not just a headache as we saw even with the data that was just presented. Um, there, uh, because it is a brain disease, there are many associated symptoms that can happen or that can occur with a migraine attack. And so it is not uncommon for, uh, for people to have the nausea and vomiting, things like that, but they may even have things like brain fogs. Or, or motion sickness, right? That might even be a, a trigger. And, and when people have these other associated symptoms and even including with the head pain, that makes driving to receive treatment a lot less desirable. So, so we need more effective treatments for migraine disease, but in order to get there, you know, research is going to pave the that road right it's going to pave that road for us to get there and and so as a clinician and and as an investigator it's great to be part of different research studies um and to to really contribute to the overall field and the overall society and so but we also though at the same time we need these research uh to be patient friendly Right. We needed to we need to understand what happens in a disease state. Right. What makes things maybe more probable or more likely to happen versus less likely to happen. Yeah. And so when when uh, Ms. Landry was saying that I don't necessarily like to, to drive and that makes that really makes sense. Right. And so so there's definitely different opportunities that are available. Thank you so much. I can see Caitlin nodding along. So. <laughs> Very much in agreement. Um, so Steve, thinking about what we've just heard, as a CEO of an organization that is developing therapeutics for migraine disease, and someone who's run both more the traditional um, trials, so going into sites, and now um, a fully remote trial, I'd love to hear um, your perspective on this and whether you think it's really embodying that patient centricity that we discuss in the industry. 
Yeah, thanks, Flo. Uh, absolutely, the the trend towards meeting people where they are to deliver care is intact and it's not going away. Uh, with COVID, we all felt the need to um, virtualize um, virtual care delivery, making things more accessible. Um, and so that is not going to change. And for our device, we have a home therapy uh, designed to be convenient um, when and where needed uh, to be able to deliver that therapy. So it only makes sense that we would capture the data in the same setting that it's intended for. So that's the first part of it. The second part of it is, as Ray Lewis said, everybody's got a plan until they get hit. And the same goes for migraine attacks. Uh, as Caitlin uh, so eloquently put it, it, it's disabling. It's not something that, hey, let's jump in the car and go see a, uh, go to the doctor's office. That's the last thing you want to do. And so we've had experience in doing both on-premise and remote studies now. And there's a stark contrast. So the um, on-premise study we ran, we had three centers. Um, we could only capture people from a 50 mile radius. That was the only feasible distance we could expect. And we did use digital recruiting. Uh, and so we had tons, thousands of applicants, even in that small geography. However, when it came time to randomize, when the migraine attack hit, they weren't able to come in. I mean, a year and a half, we only had 24 randomized which means that it took a lot of time, but it also took a lot of money and we didn't get enough information out of it. Uh, in contrast, the study that we've embarked upon now, in nine weeks, we were flooded with applicants and not only did they apply and qualify, they consented digitally and they randomized. They got to the point where they, uh, were shipped a device, had a migraine attack, and actually treated their attack and recorded their device data. So we're talking about you know years condensed into weeks, and that's very powerful. Yeah, it's very interesting, Steve, too, because um, um, I was part of one of those sites so at Michigan State. We were one of those sites, and yes, everybody had a plan. So we had a lot of people that were really that were recruited. But when it came to that randomization period, as we you hear the numbers, it was it was really low, and 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 that could be because maybe the migraine attack doesn't read clinical hours, right? It doesn't read the doorpost of the clinical hours, like oh, this is when we were supposed to have it. Um, and so you know, and, and then even with as as a uh, as a traditional site, um, as as Steve pointed out, we could only take people from a radius of of fifty really 50 miles because we needed them to get there in time um, to actually utilize the acute treatment um, for for the study and so you know those were some different uh, limitations we have clearly for years and years and years a lot of research has been site-based but it's just very um, it's very rewarding and it's very uh, promising to have a different method right to get to get recruiting so I just wanted to to to, to uh, uh, piggyback off of what, what Steve was saying, just as a as one of the uh, co-site in, investigators or the uh, site investigators, uh, PIs. And so, yeah, that was very, very interesting. So I'm hearing lots of benefits in this therapeutic area for um, remote trials and data capture. Um, Matty, I'd love to now hear from your perspective about how we actually operationalize these types of studies. Um, and from your perspective, how we think about designing, building these studies, and then any challenges we face along the way and how we might overcome them. Uh, definitely, when it came time to designing the study, we had to really think about the big picture and make sure that we considered things like the scientific perspective, the patient perspective, the remote site perspective. Plus, you know, we had to put ourselves in the place of someone right in the middle of a migraine attack. The goal here was to collect the strongest evidence possible, but do it very quickly with an expedited timeline and as it cost efficiently as possible. So when the cool tech team and the audio health team, you know, came together, 
we really created a plan around those key elements. We started with the recruitment and the enrolling of the participants, like you heard Steve say and Dr. Charleston say, that 50 mile radius can really be impactful. So we decided to use, you know, a remote strategy using social media marketing campaigns. And just like Steve said, we were able to complete all of those participants and successfully enroll them in less than nine weeks, which I know made, you know, Steve and the team very happy. We also had to arrange for device shipments. We had to think through that and time those shipments just right so that the qualifying participants would be sure to get their devices in time to capture that next migraine. But then we had to really think about what do we do to get the devices returned back? We had to make sure that they return them, which was a little bit tricky, but so far we've had excellent compliance, almost 100% compliance. We had to think through how do we capture the data during a migraine attack using our app, using, you know, for ePro. So we actually created a migraine tracker in the app so that the participants could capture all their migraines in real time with just a simple click of a button. Um, that was a little bit difficult because imagine you're in the middle of a migraine and we're having to complete, you know, a migraine tracker and collect that meaningful data. So we had to make it really easy for the patients to, to participate in that, which they did. They used the ePros right on their mobile phone and they were able to collect that data in real time with the cleanest, most pristine data possible, which is really important to the client and very difficult to do in a traditional trial. Um, for that, we did involve system programmed alerts and notifications that deployed strategically to keep those participants compliant, engaged, retained, and we just really wanted to ensure that they completed the study. So, atop of the you know alerts and the notifications, we also had our virtual site team that was there to support the participant every step of the way. You know, and of course, we had to also consider all of the challenges. We we anticipated most of the challenges, I have to say, but then we had those curveballs, like we had last week. We had a doozy that we had to, you know, you know, address, which we did, and we're working through a solution now. But um, we really just thought about all the challenges. We've considered all the past trials that we've done in a decentralized fashion, and we're able to apply them to this trial. So we really wanted to make sure that we recruited the right participant with the right type of migraine attacks so that our qualification criteria had to be on point. We wanted to make sure that our training materials and our videos were really, really easy to understand and robust enough to ensure that our participants knew, you know, how to use the device when the migraine hit. So the training materials had to be in the app. They had to be accessible whenever they wanted to, to refresh their memory so that they can make sure that they use that device properly right when that migraine was hitting. And we had to make sure that the patients were engaged, that they were complying, that, you know, we had enough alerts and notifications to make sure that they were doing what they were supposed to do. Because if you don't have those completers, we knew that we wouldn't be able to power our study. So having our patients complete was top of mind. It was just, it was a lot to think about, but designing the study with care, you know, was infinitely critical to the success of the study because without it, the execution would have been disastrous. Those are great points, Maddie. And as the sponsor, I uh, feel beholden to bring out a guest star here. So I brought my friend, my helper with me. So this is the device that would be sent to uh, people kind enough to participate like Caitlin. And they, they've never seen this before. They don't know what to do. I've got a migraine. You know, how do I figure out how to deliver the therapy, uh, and then go through the whole process of re recording the data. And the only way that we found that's useful to know is by doing testing. Uh, usability testing is uh, irreplaceable. You, I strongly advise that you do it, uh, not, not only for comprehension and the mechanics of what to do and how to do it, um, uh, but also the follow through and understanding what, what are the questions we're asking? You know, pain is a subjective thing. So how do I answer the questions in a way that's, you know, uniform, right? How, how do we get a data set that's reflective of the therapeutic benefit that the device can deliver? And so the only way to do that is to even test your questions. So unbeknownst to us, the FDA requires a cognitive debrief and usability test, a formal study, to make sure that when people are um, giving their, their their outcomes, that they truly did understand the, the question, the criteria, the scale, 
And um, so we tested that. Uh, we did a study of this study ahead of time, and we tested everything from how do I unbox, how do I set it up, how do I use it, um, did I understand the training video, or did I plug the wrong thing in the wrong place, even though I saw it because we weren't clear and we didn't communicate the way someone needed um, to be communicated to. So it's it's that that whole process um, working with Avio Health. It was amazing because they've done this over and over again, and they could point out better ways to educate and train. Thank you. Um, so I'd now like let's take some of those pieces that we've just discussed. And Caitlin, I'd love to hear your perspective on the recruitment element, how you were recruited into the study and what your experience of that was like. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I had vis visited my um, neurologist here um, in South Louisiana and um, I was on Facebook and as Maddie said they used you know those um, social, me social media marketing techniques and that's where I saw it um, clicked on it um, and within a few days I was asked to download the app um, you know completed questionnaires just to to ensure that I was a right fit the right fit you know for the study and yeah it was super super easy very convenient. And that's very good to hear. Um, Steve, from your perspective, obviously a different style of recruitment to how we would probably recruit for more traditional trials. Um, how did you find it? Yeah, so we were blessed to have Caitlin and the other participants um, volunteer their time uh, to be in the study. And the last thing we wanted to do is to burden them with additional things that, that are a real hassle. And, and one thing we looked at was whether or not we wanted to require them to deliver all their medical records. And I'm not sure if you've ever done it, but it's not an easy process. Um, and so it, instead of asking her to run around and find all the records, um, we did a diary period. We did a run-in period. Let's get to know um, the participant Let's understand um, over time what, what's actually happening with them. How, how many attacks uh, are occurring? What type of attacks are occurring? There are ways to ask questions to understand if this is truly the profile of a qualifying, you know, qualifying for the inclusion and exclusion criteria. So that experience, and we actually ask over a four week period every day uh, for participants to diary their experience. Did they have an attack? If they did, what kind of attack? We ask all the right questions to figure that out. And then we also give some practice to the participant. So when they do have an attack and they have to uh, answer questions at the baseline before they've had any therapy and then at different intervals thereafter, um, they'll, they'll be familiar with the process. It won't be intimidating. And so that, that practice period, that get to know you period, the building of the relationships important. Uh, and then it all culminates then in, in, a, in a randomization of the subject of treatment and data capture. So, um, so yeah, that's, that's very important um, that you consider a run-in period uh, to your studies. And I, I think we, we learned, Steve, you said a couple of different things as far as you know, getting the medical records and how that could be confusing and depends on documentation and things like that. And I think we learned that from some of the, the study that we, we did on, on site. And uh, so it was a growing process. Um, and, and actually with recruiting too, and Steve, you, you, you said something else about the FDA. I wanna bring the FDA uh, back up again, uh, because with uh having this more on a virtual versus uh, traditional traditional has its merit it's, it's again it's what we've been do, doing you know all this time essentially um but there's also an opportunity to inc uh, improve the diversity of the patient population right and then the fda is even committed to uh to, to working with sponsors to identify barriers and overcome uh, to, to, to leverage the best practices for that contributes to improving the uh, patient diversity in clinical trials. And they also have something um, what's called the, the, the drug trials snapshot that they uh, recently published 
uh, that can kind of help with that dialogue. And, and this is one of those things because, you know, whether it, it, you're looking at um, uh, ethnically uh, underrepresented uh, participants or you're looking at rural participants. Um, and so you have different special populations that we need actually more into studies. I mean, you're looking at a lot of different things. We need more uh, uh, into studies. And so that's really, really cool about the recruitment process too. I mean, obviously it requires a little bit of technology. I mean, you, you know, uh, as, as uh, Ms. Landry said, she was, it was social media that really uh, connected with her, right? And so, um, so, so we have to think about that, but, but this type of process, it does make it easier for parents uh, uh, such as uh, Ms. Caitlin, Ms. Caitlin uh, that are caring for ch children. I mean, you know, I mean, it, even if you could bring your kids there, I mean, I have patients sometimes they bring their kids in and, and I have two small ones myself. So, I mean, I, I, I totally get it. We just, you know, just sit down and everything. But I mean, but that's tough. So you're trying to handle that. You're trying to drive in a, an acute attack, right? An acute a migraine head pain attack um, in com combination with all those other phases of migraine, the prodrome, postdrome, and some people have aura. I mean, it, you know, so so it becomes a lot. So this does make it a, a bit more patient uh, friendly and it minimize the impact on the, uh, uh, I say patient, but participants, right, for studies, um, the impact on, on their lives as far as taking time off of work or having to try to find a babysitter or trying to do certain things like that. And so it's just, again, more patient friendly or participant friendly. Well, it's great to hear how positive everyone is about this type of recruitment method. So I think, you know, lots of these things with remote studies, they're new. It's changed from what we're used to doing. So it's great to hear three different perspectives um, and all, all very positive about it. Um, and it will be great to see the data that comes out of this in terms of diversity. Um, so another thing that you touched on, Matty and Steve, was the element of training for this study so it wasn't just about the training for how to use the app for data collection but also the actual device and how important that was to the success of the trial and um, caitlin i'd love to hear how you experienced the training yeah um so i am a very visual learner um there are videos um that you can watch and rewatch any time that you want to um so it trains you on how to use the device when you're having an attack um prior to actually having the attack but they also have um a booklet in there that you know re-illustrates or illustrates and reiterates um the steps in using it um so that was great for me um they also have a live chat option um, basically a live chat option. Um, you can message at any point um, if you have an issue, if there's something wrong with your device, it's not working, you, know, you reach out and you have that peace of mind that there's somebody there. Um, you know, you, I didn't feel alone that I was, you know, left to my own devices with this device. <laughs> um, but uh, the, so the experience with the study team was awesome. Um, it was very easy. Um, they also have, um, as Maddie said, uh, notifications in the app. And one of the things that they had to balance was um, you know, the amount. Um, for me, uh, they send you a notification um, in the afternoon around seven um, to do your daily check-in. Um, I think there was a few times that I forgot that. But again, you know, being a mother, um, he's a five-year-old um, ball of energy and a petri dish. Um, I forgot a couple of times. Um, so I would have liked the option to uh, have a reminder or, you know, kind of like a snooze button, like remind me again in 10, 15 minutes. Um, but, you know, yeah, uh, everything was super hands-on, um, super easy. You know, it's, it's interesting, actually, Caitlin, that you say that about the notifications. And thank you for that feedback, because that's really helpful when we're designing the project. But we actually really thought about those alerts and notifications when we were putting the study together because we didn't want to have, we wanted to have enough that it was efficient, that people were doing what they were supposed to do and they were compliant, but not so many that we were now burdening a participant, right? That we were disturbing them or even like, you know, creating a migraine, you know, giving them more of a headache. So we had to just be really careful with that. But that's great feedback. So I think maybe then we can, next time we design a study like this, we can incorporate that and make it, make sure that it's much more robust. But some people really paid attention to the alerts and notifications and reacted to that. 
And then some people kind of ignored those little helpful tools, but we did have a virtual site team, which Caitlin mentioned, which was there to support the participants and help them and nudge them and encourage them and remind them. So we did have that manual touch point um, to that to help enhance those notifications. But thanks, Caitlin, for that, because we'll take that into consideration for the next study. Yeah, so I think it's it's really nice to hear, and I think some people maybe think this is a fully remote study, is that there's no human touch point. So that's not true. And I think this is a great example of that. And Matty, maybe you can speak more to the team that we have, obviously, they're called our coach team, but they're very much the virtual site there to support participants throughout their journey. Yes, they sure are. The, the virtual site team is, is a great concept for us, because you know, when you're in a traditional site, you have the benefit of your investigator and your coordinator right there that you can see. But our virtual site team has to work even harder, right? Because they are in remote capacity and they have to develop that relationship with the participant. But our virtual site team is comprised of the same kinds of resources that you would find at a traditional site. We have investigators, we have coordinators, we have registered nurses, and we have all that team that is supporting the participants, that it's helping, that's helping them through the consent process. You know, answering questions, like Caitlin said, you know, answering chat messages so that you have instant, you know, responses to your questions or instant help if you need it. Um, and they're there just supporting the participant. They're, they're checking compliance, they're checking um, engagement, and they're making sure that you complete, that you're successful in your journey, and that the experience was stellar. So, uh, you know, we really appreciate our virtual site team because they're a great enhancement to the project, when, especially when you're remote. And hopefully it also puts Steve's mind at ease in terms of ensuring that the participants completed their data collection and we uh, had all the data that we needed for the study. Um, so I think we've seen lots of regulatory guidance come out recently about decentralized clinical trials. And I think the premise really is that when we're running these types of trials, we've still got the main guiding principles. It's the participants' well-being, their safety, and the robustness of the data. And that really shouldn't change depending on whether you're conducting your trial remotely, whether some elements are remote, or whether it's fully site-based and more traditional trial. Those guiding principles are still the same. Um, and I think we've shown here today um, with this trial that it is entirely possible. Obviously, it's very much going to depend on your study design, your therapeutic area, your therapeutic, the data you're trying to capture. But it's definitely possible to conduct a study in this way and reduce the burden for participants to participate in trials. Um, Dr. Charleston, Obviously, from a physician's perspective and also an investigator in clinical trials, um, do you think we're going to start seeing more trials being run this way? Are there any concerns that you have about running them in this way? Well, as well, Dr. Molan, um, the I think you said, and I really concur with what you said, that as far as the rigor of the research and the a priori um, study design is extremely important whether this is done in a in a clinical site or whether it's done virtually or digitally i think that when we start looking at how even medicine is being practiced with and, and even that data that you presented uh, at the very beginning where there was increased people that wanted the the tele uh, telehealth right uh there was a, a higher percentage there um I, I think this is the way that we're we're going i don't know if it's going to go a hundred percent all the way virtual I mean, in, in, in fact, in fact, if we were doing studies and we were doing, um, you know, intracerebral hemorrhage or that's a, bl a, a blood on the brain or what have you, then I mean, you're probably going to need to be in the ICU for that study, right? I mean, that that's going to have to. It's not going to be something that you know that you you're going to send a patient home and then say, hey, be a participant in the study. So, so we have to be. I, I think we have to be critical in how we think about the studies. We have to be critical in how we um, design the studies. And I think that the medical community and the uh, and the research community, as long as that rigor, that scientific rigor is there, all right. I mean, there's going to be challenges whether it's traditional or virtual, right? And we 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 all see them. We all uh, heard of them and 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 things like that. So we do have to make sure that the the data and the the safety like they're still monitoring right monitor boards or what have you um and that we utilize uh, uh the the nih has or nindS so in national institutes of uh neurology uh, uh disorders and stroke um they we have what's called common data elements as far as headache common data elements 
right? And so one of the things is, is using these common data elements that uh, for a, a migraine trial per, per se, um, so that this data is researched and we can all understand that data. And whether it's done in, in a traditional site or, or digitally, I don't think that that has, uh, as long as it's done well um, and, and with rigor, I think there's gonna be very, very much accepted either, either or. And so we're really changing the paradigm I think um, just just in general, right? Uh, just uh, the paradigm has changed to be, become more patient centric, or or more subject or participant uh, centric, right? And understanding the disease process. So the example that I gave about the the intracerebral hemorrhage or or what have you, that's understanding that disease process and where that care needs to be taken care of. Most pe people have uh, migraine attacks are you know I mean they they're, they're living their life with them, right? And so. And so that's a little bit something that's done more on an outpatient setting. So just being, again, that a priority study design, really thinking through, critically thinking through, um, you know, even adaptive designs for, for, for studies and, and things like that. I think that is going to be well accepted uh, for the community and increase our opportunities to have more inclusion, more diversity, more patient population um, into the studies. And if I can add on to that, Dr. Charleston, I, I think that there are many therapies that are delivered in hospitals and in clinics that um, can benefit from the follow-up, the quality of life follow-up, uh, the, the patient recorded outcomes, which are so in, important. So we, we may have delivered a therapy on site, but then we have to longitudinally understand the experience of that participant over time. And so I, I see um, a lot of opportunity on the front end to bring in more diversity into the studies with digital methods. Um, and then even if the care is on site, then the, the, the follow-up thereafter. Um, so you can have all kinds of hybrid studies, you can have someone recruited come in, receive the therapy, go home even with the, the technology after the benefit of having that time with clinical staff, and then record their experience and, and uh, provide data uh, back to the sponsor and back to the clinicians. Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up because patient reported outcomes are huge in headache medicine right now, right? They are huge. Um, so I'm glad you brought that up, Steve. Yeah, it's all about study design, isn't it, in your specific study and in thinking about if what is the right solution for your study, where should data capture take place, do you need site visits, don't you? Um, so it's a, not a one site of it's all by any means. Um, before we do go over to the Q&A section of this webinar, um, one last quick yes or no question to uh, Steve and Caitlin. So, Steve, would you run a trial in this way again, a fully remote trial? Yes, absolutely. Okay, great. And Caitlin, as a participant, based on your experience of this study, would you participate in a fully remote trial again? What Steve said, <laughs> yes, absolutely. <laughs> Well, that's great to hear. Um, okay, so I'm just going to hand back to Sonia now before we turn over to the Q&A section. Well, firstly, I'd like to say thank you very much for that very engaging presentation. I hope everyone enjoyed it. And now we're going to begin the Q&A portion of the webinar. So I just want to remind the audience you still have the opportunity right now to continue to send in your questions using that questions window, and we'll try to attend to your questions during the time we have together. So with that, I will now pass it back over to my co-moderator, Flo, so that she can facilitate the Q&A. So there you go, Flo. Thank you. Um, okay, so first question that we've got coming in is about what other therapeutic areas the approach um, that we've discussed today would be possible in. Um, so does it extend to other therapeutic areas running a fully remote trial? And is there any other considerations that you think? Um, Steve, I don't know if we want to start with you. Sure. So behind uh, this you know, great endeavor to improve healthcare, there are business considerations. And so for someone like us who has a platform for pain and mood disorders, uh, migraine being one of them, 
it's important that over time we can build our label, um, add evidence, and learn to find out um, what else it can do uh, to help people. And so um, additional studies are required and uh, desirable. So we have acute episodic migraine. Well, what about the chronic population? We need to add that in. And, and yes, it may have worked on the first migraine, but over a period of months, what does that look like? Um, repeat usage. And then, you know, what about people who have other types of headache, like cluster headaches and tension headaches? Why don't we study those as well? And should we stop there? No. Well, what about people suffering from depression, anxiety, PTSD? The same nerve pathways that are, um, you know, in um, incorporated into the symptoms of those mood disorders are, are uh, exactly what we're addressing with, with this device. So, you know, it, it really just opens up uh, into a wide range of studies that um, we should consider. And it's not only for the benefit of the clinicians to say, in my practice of medicine, is this appropriate for my patients? It's for consumers to get more information about what, what's important to them. And then going back to the business of it, um, you, you need reimbursement, right? The, the payers, the insurance companies, are they going to cover it? Well, they require high levels of data as well. So it's, it's, it's a never ending journey, um, but it's a fruitful one to think about, you know, just how far you can go with this. And all of those I mentioned could be done remotely. Um, and Matty, oh, there we go. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, Flo. I'm sure you were probably going to go the same place I was going to go. But um, what I was going to say was that, you know, interestingly enough, there's just so many therapeutic areas that we can actually apply this, you know, model to this decentralized model, device trials, interventional, observational. We've completed here at Avio Health quite a bit of them. But even if we just talk about devices, we've done quite a few device trials as well. We just finished one actually, was it last year? I think it was we did a device uh, of pelvic floor disorder, but it, it's all about customizing it to that project, customizing it to the needs and the primary endpoints of that project and designing it with, you know, beginning with the end in mind. And I think if you can do that and think holistically about that project and think about how you can incorporate, you know, remote type of, you know, in, uh, you know tasks or instruments that you can do remotely, that, that's key because that takes away the burden from the participant, from the site, uh, it's more cost effective. It, it's, uh, you know, timelines are reduced. So it absolutely can, you know, span across lots of therapeutic areas. And I think we have to, you know, I came from the traditional setting, 30 years in the traditional setting. So it was very difficult for me to wrap my mind around the decentralized clinical trial model at first. But um, I, I mean, I clearly see the benefit of it and how it really has revolutionized, you know, the industry. So uh, yeah, we got to think outside the box when we're designing these projects. And especially hearing what Caitlin's been saying today, I think potentially, Caitlin, I don't want to speak on your behalf, but you might not have been able to take part in this trial had it not been for it being fully remote. Absolutely. Um, and, you know, Maddie mentioned that they did a pelvic floor one. I feel like that's something that I would want to do in my home versus, you know, going in to see someone and have it do them, have them do that for me. Um, you know, that's a very personal experience, I feel. Yeah, and I think it's important to say, I think we've kind of discussed this already, that it isn't a one size fits all, that when a, you're planning your study from the sponsor perspective, from the provider perspective, that you really are looking at the therapeutic area. What's the intervention within your trial? And does it make sense to be fully remote? Or is it that you can just make some ele elements remote to facilitate participation, to remove the bur burden for the participant, um, burden for the site? Um, but as Matty said, it's definitely about looking at the study that you've got. I don't think you can say one TA is definitely you can always do it this way and one TA you definitely can't. I think it's really dependent on the actual study. Um, okay, so Matty, this one might be for you. Um, what, what are the most common challenges that you have found to conducting trials in this way? I think we've probably touched on some of them today, so maybe the top one or two, if you can. 
Yeah, I mean, the challenges for de you know, developing a fully remote trial is really how do you, you know, arrive at your primary endpoints using a remote method, right? And making sure that you're touching those participants. Developing that relationship is very critical because you have to you have to have that, tr that trusting relationship. So we have to make sure that we are educating our participants that we're, you know, that, that the training is really robust, that they really understand it, because especially in this case, they had to collect that data in the middle of a migraine. We had to really put ourselves in their position. How do we do that when they're in so much pain? I suffer from migraines myself, so I was like, wow, that's going to be difficult. But, you know, we did. You have to think through that. It's all about designing it with that customized type of approach to reach your primary endpoints from the beginning, thinking everything through. And it just requires, you know, when you've done it a little bit, like we have, we've been doing it for about seven years now, it, 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 we, 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 Think about those challenges and we and we use the lessons learned to incorporate it. So it's getting easier and a lot more, you know, fluent as we go along from trial to trial. But um, I, I think that the top challenges are really just making sure that you have considered, you know, um, what could go wrong and tackle it before it gets there. Anticipate those challenges. Thank you. Um, so we've discussed today about accessibility. Um, you know, accessibility, we've also talked about diversity and inclusion in clinical trials, and we've been discussing um, digital methods for recruitment and how they can really increase accessibility and increase the diversity of your um, trial population. But we've got a question about whether it could potentially lead to exclusion of people as well. So even though it's increasing accessibility for some, is it actually reducing accessibility for others? For example, older people is given. Um, would anyone like to take that? I can take I can take that um, because I mean it's an area that uh, I, I've worked in in a lot and and even with we when we look at the data of even telehealth, I mean some some populations may be excluded i mean if they don't have great broadband uh coverage right um and and so i, I think that we have to we have to be very cognizant of these potential uh uh challenges or as far as exclusions and and very meticulous in how we are doing the study designs and also in the recruitment measures because um just because you know you know my my put it like this my, my grandmother is you know she, she she didn't really get to texting or whatever but she would call but she had me right so she had me so that i could even help her you know with with different things um and so that's i think that's important too to really understand the community when we're when when, when i think about when i think about patients or, or, or especially patients but even participants in studies you know they have a community Right, and so if we can address the community, sometimes we can get to the uh, to the patients as well. In in, in in even in traditional studies, we also always have inclusion and exclusion criteria. So by nature of study designs, some patients are excluded um, just because of what we're looking for. We want to make sure that that uh, you know is reproducible, is rigorous, and 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 uh, and hopefully has generalizability in in the general population. At the same time, I still think that having you know a, a digital method of recruitment um, is is something that is more likely to be more inclusive than less inclusive. Um, and so I do think that I think that's a legitimate uh, concern for different populations or special populations in headache medicine. But I do think that these are some of the things that can be thought of pre uh, a priori or so uh, you know really ahead of time. Um, and it can address, you know, perhaps it's a community center. Maybe it's a community center that, you know, uh, in, in a particular communities, there's a there's a senior community center that that uh, someone in that center can let people know and kind of help or what have you. So, uh, and when we say digital, and it's been said before, it's not all the way. I mean, there are people that are involved too, right? We talked about the coach team and things like that. So there's still people that are involved. It's just a different method, uh, I, I think. So. We actually thought about that, you know, when we were first, the first, when the DCT model came out, that was something that we thought about. Well, can, can like the older population, part, let's just say as an example, can the older population participate? We had to, again, think through how to make it as easy as possible, as user-friendly as possible, make sure that the training is there, 
But we decided, well, can, you know, can everybody just understand the technology? I mean, maybe that could be a problem, you know? So we did run a study, you know, a few years ago, um, you know, to see, you know, how difficult would it be? You know, who, how, what's the age group that's most compliant within our trials? And we really found out that it's age agnostic, that our, that the, the, the you know, the, um, the EPRO element or using the, your, you know, mobile phone to collect that information is age agnostic because it was interesting that the majority of the participants that were the most compliant were the ones that were 55 and up. So I don't know if it's compliant or responsible, not sure which one of the two, but, you know, definitely they were the most compliant. That tells me that they had no problem maneuvering the technology. So, you know, it, it is something to think about, though, when you're running that trial, you know, if you don't want to exclude anybody. And I also think that even if you're doing digital recruitment, that doesn't mean that that's your only way to recruit participants. You can still be recruiting at site and through user group. Um, so again, it's not an all or nothing approach as you know, nothing is in this industry. It's all about yeah. providing different options. Yeah. I mean, you could do like a, you know, it doesn't always have to be fully remote all the way. I mean, say for instance, you have a hybrid trial and there's a site involved and there has to be site re, you know related tasks you know imaging labs or things that you know you have you need to do at a site for whatever reason you can still incorporate decentralized components into that trial it doesn't have to be like flow set all or nothing because when you introduce you know remote tasks or decentralized tasks you really are increasing the pristine the, the, you know the cleanliness of the data you're introducing um cost efficiency time efficiency you know, just for instance, I think we all know really well that, you know, when you're at a site, sometimes, sometimes when patients are completing their diaries, there's that parking lot effect, right? Where there's sometimes you're completing diaries right in the parking lot before you go in because you knew it was due um, and you knew you had to do a, a month's worth. Um, and this, you know, doing it, you know, with a decentralized model removes all of that, right? It removes that. You're collecting all that data in real time. So that's very helpful. I think, I think, Clients like to know that their data is actually pristine, that it's clean, that it's exactly you know, collected when it's happening. Um, so it, again, it doesn't have to be all hybrid, it doesn't have to be all remote. You can incorporate you know, methods of that into your site-based studies um, for more efficiency and you know, that kind of strong evidence that we're looking for. And then I think um, thinking about that, you know, how we operationalize these types of trials when you haven't got that physical site. Um, so in America, we've obviously got 50 or more states. Um, <laughs> and how do we, if we've got a virtual study, how do we think about PI oversight um, across states? Do you have to have a PI in every single state? I suppose it's different if you're prescribing versus you are responsible for the research side of things. Um, Matty, I think you might be able to give a perspective on that. Yeah, you know, that was a concern early on um, when the DCT model or, or really the need for telehealth visits were introduced. But since then, and really in response to that huge need for telehealth visits, the states introduced what's called the Interstate Medical Licensure Compact. And this type of multi-state licensure really helps streamline the licensing process across the states. And it, it still lets us preserve that state oversight. So, you know, prescribing, non-prescribing, all of those things are, you know, they come into play. But um, that type of licensure is what allows our PIs to provide the research-related care and study oversight across the states. Thank you. Um, so before we end, any last comments, lasting thoughts from the panel? If I may. I wanna, um, I wanna thank Caitlin again for her participation uh in in this discussion and in the study and uh I, I can't say enough how uh grateful we are thank you thank you um if i may i did just want to obviously i can't speak to any other demographic but my own um the way that everything was set up um as far as the app the instruction um, the peace of mind that i had from the um, team as a whole um, was super easy, um, very self-explanatory. If there was something that I needed help with or had a question about, it was pretty easy to find within the app. Um, and I feel like even even my mother, um, who is the one that normally um, volunteers me 
um, whether I know it or not for different things, um, computer wise, whatever, um, would more than likely be able to figure that out. Um, it was that easy. So. And I just, well, the last thoughts is that uh, I agree with Steve, uh, Caitlin, you and all the, the, the people that participate in studies to help move our, our field forward. I mean, I just really want to give a heartfelt uh, thank you and, and gratitude to to you and, and, and um, all of our, you know, in the in the headache community. I mean, there's over 300 different headache diagnoses. So so we, we really, we really do appreciate um, the participants in, in clinical trials and, and studies and things like that. So we have advanced yeah. without them. So thank you, Caitlin. It wouldn't be possible. Um, I also want to extend a thank you to all of my panelists today. You've brought some great insight and perspectives um, on remote clinical trials for devices. So thank you very much. Thank since you. We're, well. Since we're all about thank yous, let me thank you also for all those answers. Thank you for your time. We have reached the end of the Q&A portion of the webinar. If we couldn't attend to your questions, rest assured that the team at Avio Health will follow up with you after this presentation. And if you have any further questions, please address them to the email addresses that you see there on your screen. Thank you everyone for participating in today's webinar. You will be receiving a follow-up email from Xtalks with access to the recorded archive of this event. A survey window will be popping up on your screen. Your participation is appreciated as it will help us to improve on our further webinars. Additionally, I have shared a link to view the recording. I'll do that momentarily of this event, which you can also share with your colleagues, colleagues once they register for this recording as well. And I just wanted to mention that we do have some um, presentations that you can download the supporting material uh, that you can see there under the handouts tab and we have four there for you an info sheet obvio health virtual site sheet uh, for the team there a patient engagement playbook and an mwm checklist so please go ahead and check that out and now i just want to say thank you again to our speakers for their time here today uh, my name is sonia hunt it has been my pleasure to be your co moderator for today's event on behalf of the team here at x talks we thank you for joining us i'm sonia hunt until next time please take care and bye for now bye everyone thank you for thank you everyone bye thank you